Hello, everybody. Welcome to another NLP with friends. Um, we're really excited to have Clara here today. Um, a couple reminders of logistical things. We're going to use Dory to collect questions. I've just put the link in the chat. Um, always feel free to message in the chat as well, should you have an issue or be unable to find the link. Um, and yeah, so um, Clara is newly a second year at uh, ETH in Zurich. Hey. Um, <laughs> <woo -hoo. laughs> um, and uh, as you'll hear a bit in a second, um, she works mostly on uh, statistical methods and NLP and language generation and as a fun bonus, also likes hiking and finding awesome chocolate in the Zurich area. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her now and we'll chat at the end for questions. Well, thanks Liz for the intro um, and thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, as, as you probably know, I'm Clara. And today I was going to talk about uh, my paper from EMNLP um, titled, uh, if beam search is the answer, what was the question? Um, so this is uh, one area of my research right now um, is language generation. And this paper um, kind of ties uh, language generation into cognitive science um, and shows a nice little connection um, between good language generation and um, what we as humans perceive as good language. Um, so with that, I'll get started. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me at any point. Um, I think it'd probably just be best if you like turned your mic on and said something. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can see the little like hand raises or whatever those are. Okay, so let's get started. Um, like I was saying, uh, title of our paper, if beam search is the answer, what was the question? Um, so, um, I imagine that many of you are familiar with the topic of decoding neural language generators, but um, I'll give a brief recap and uh, define the exact problem that we're considering in this paper. So uh, many of today's uh, coolest, well, in my opinion, coolest NLP tasks involve language generation. So think image captioning, um, translation. Uh, these are tasks that uh, we have a model basically generating text. Um, and the models that we typically use for these tasks are neural probabilistic language generators. Um, so a neural probabilistic language generator is a model of conditional probability. Um, so it's a probability distribution over all sequences of text um, given some input. So, uh, I mean, here I'm talking about conditional language generation. There's also unconditional language generation like uh, story generation. Um, but for the purposes of this paper, we're considering just conditional language generation. Um, so here we can see a small example of text generation uh, translation. So given a short sentence, um, our model provides a probability distribution over all strings in our target language. Um, and so here we can see that our model is assigning higher probability to a more plausible translation, which is what we would hope, right? Um, so since this is just probabilistic modeling, um, at inference time, we want to return the most probable uh, solution under the model. Um, and you might recognize this problem here as just maximum a posteriori inference which in the context of language generation, we call the decoding problem. Um, so you can think of this informally as what's the most probable translation uh, for the source sentence that we have. Um, but the problem here is that our output space uh, is really big. So like in machine translation, it's the set of all sentences that can be generated from a vocabulary. Um, and this number of sentences is, can can quite easily become uh, greater than the number of particles in the universe, that sort of deal. So, um, so then how do we generally solve this problem? Um, that is how do we generate text from our model? Uh, well, in the case of neural generators, um, we typically have locally normalized distributions over words at each time step. And so that is we model the conditional probability of a word given the input and all previously generated words. 
So then we iteratively generate words according to this distribution. Um, and luckily for us with the power of neural networks, uh, we don't even have to make any independence assumptions. So um, no like n-gram assumptions here. Um, we can condition on the entire past uh, without having this model that basically just explodes in complexity. Um, but uh, those structural independence assumptions that come with uh, neural networks, they're what make dynamic programming methods for decoding so efficient. Um, so that's the trade-off that we've made. Um, and this means that for tasks like machine translation, to solve this optimization problem exactly, uh, we may need to in a, uh, independently explore a number of paths that's just infeasible. Um, yeah, I mean, this number, like I was saying, this number can explode even under mild conditions. And our dynamic programming methods that we used in the good old statistical machine translation days um, may not even terminate. So um, we turn to instead heuristic methods like beam search. Um, and in a nutshell, beam search is a pruned version of breadth first search where the breadth is limited to uh, some size K. So we extend only K sequences at each time step. Um, and we stop at a predetermined maximum sequence length. Um, and since this is a heuristic method, there's no guarantee that we'll actually find the most probable sequence under the model. So the question then that comes to mind is how often do we find the most probable sequence under the model with beam search? And um, yeah, so that is how often does beam search find this global optimum in language generation tasks? And it turns out that the answer is not too often. So these are results from MT systems um, and uh, from a paper in 2019 um, with a cute title, uh, something about cats got your tongue. Um, but uh, they showed that with a beam size of 10, um, beam search found the global optimum in less than 50% of cases. Um, and with greedy search, it was like, you know, only here it's like 26% of cases did it find the global optimum. So but we also see that beam search is doing really well in terms of our quality evaluation metrics for the language that it generates. Um, and so- uh, Clara? Yeah? Uh, what, what do you mean by global optimum in this case? The glo Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, what do you mean by global optimum in this setup? So um, this problem like that, here. Trans like that translation, the actual translation? Well, global optimum, like as in uh, the most probable sentence under the model. So we oh, have this okay. probability distribution here, here, like this is, you can think of this as our probability distribution. And mm. we're searching for the most probable sequence. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so, and I think you can see kind of here why it's the case that we might not be able to find the most probable sequence. Um, so if we are only extending K paths at each time step, um, then we might, like there might be some path that we don't uh, go down that while at like time step one, it's not close to optimal. Um, later on, it could accumulate most of the probability mass and then be the global optimum. Um, yeah, so uh, so with, that's that's the problem right now with beam surgery that we don't always find the global optimum. Uh, it's just a heuristic method. Um, so, but it seems to be doing a lot better than exact search in terms of our quality evaluation metrics. Um, and so, what we see from what we see from this is that the solution to maximum a posteriori inference is clearly not desirable text. Um, here, blue is like two points, which is pretty. That's like you know, almost random guessing bad. Um, but the solution provided by Beam Search does seem to be desirable text. So, the question now is, how did we come up with this amazing solution? Um, and perhaps we can gain some insight by looking at the algorithm for beam search. Uh, or maybe not. So this is our algorithm for beam search, um, which 
is quite clunky. And um, given all the constraints uh, and all the definitions, it's kind of not immediately obvious what this recursion is really maximizing. Um, so can we rewrite this as some sort of just simple optimization problem? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, so we're asking now what problem does beam search solve? So what is this uh, optimization problem that we can rewrite beam search as? Okay, so um, the way that we approached the problem in this paper was first looking at the simplest case, which is greedy search, which that's just beam search with a, a breadth size of one, right? So um, here we're looking for some formula that when optimized over, um, returns the same solution as greedy search. Okay, so it feels intuitive that like a good starting spot is to have that original um, log probability in our optimization problem, right? I mean, greedy search, while it might not find the global optimum, it's still somewhat maximizing probability. Okay, so um, we have our original objective in here, uh, log probability. Um, but there has to be some other sort of term, right? Because gre greedy search doesn't actually turn the always return the global optimum. So we can look at this additional term as like a regularizer. Um, and if we use this regularizer here, um, it turns out that we can get the same solution as uh, greedy search as we take our uh, lambda to infinity. Um, and to, to like give this equation in words, um, it's like there's a lot of math going on here, um, but it's actually, it's pretty simple. We're just looking at the distance between the log probability of our chosen word and that of the highest probability word at that given time step. Um, so that's what our regularizer is going to be. Um, and we can now see that um, as we take lambda to infinity, as this, this penalty, starts to overwhelm the objective, um, then we will necessarily have to choose the highest probability uh, word at each time step in order to um, not have a, our objective evaluate to negative infinity. Um, so that's why we get the same solution as greedy search here. Um, okay, so how can we generalize this to the case when we're dealing with sets rather than just single hypotheses? Um, well, first we have to consider that uh, we need some sort of set function, right? Before we just had um, probability over a single string, but now we're dealing with sets. So um, we're simply going to define uh, the probability of a set as the product uh, of the probabilities of um, the individual sequences. Um, and actually, like technically, we could also do this with addition. We could also just have it be the sum, um, just because there's no there's no interactions between these scores uh, explicitly. So we we use multiplication here just because once you, once you take the log, then it becomes nicer. Um, you don't have to do like log addition then. Uh, but anyway, um, so now using the same logic as for greedy search we can formulate our beam search regularizer, uh, which we can see is quite similar to the greedy search regularizer. Um, and it also encourages us to choose the uh, highest probability subset at any given decoding step. Um, and again, as we take our regularizer to infinity, um, then we will necessarily return the same solution as beam search because we need to, um, at that step, choose the probability maximizing set in order to uh, avoid a penalty of infinity. Okay, so that was nice, right? You know, like all this math, why am I doing this? Why am I showing this to you? Why does it matter? Um, so explicitly the question I'm saying is like, what do these optimization problems tell us about beam search? So um, to do that, we're first going to rewrite our regularizers uh, in terms of surprisal. And surprisal is a concept from information theory that just gives us a uh, quantification of the level of surprise of a particular outcome. 
Um, and the formal definition of surprisal is just negative log probability, uh, which is what, we, we, what we've been dealing with this entire time. Um, so we're really just subbing in uh, this one term and it turns out that actually makes it a lot prettier once we do anyway. Um, so uh, let's, so now we've, we've rewritten our beam search regularizer in terms of surprisal. Um, and in this notation, we can see that our beam search regularizer is uh, penalizing the square distance from the lowest surprisal choice. Right before we were framing it as the square distance from the highest probability choice. Um, so there, there's like this natural parallel here, right? Um, so this means that when we choose a higher than minimal surprisal set, um, the score of the solution is negatively impacted. And this just tells us that beam search enforces low surprisal choices at each time step. Okay. Hopefully I haven't lost anyone because it's like, that's really all of the technical stuff here. And now we get into some fun, more uh, cognitive science stuff. Um, so what does this mean in the context of language generation? What does it mean that beam search is enforcing low surprisal choices? Like how does that lead to generation of good language? Um, so to answer that question, we're gonna turn to cognitive science um, where we find the uniform information density hypothesis. Um, now, here you can read the formal hypothesis, but the uh, TLDR is that humans prefer sentences that evenly distribute information across a sentence. We don't like moments of high surprisal. So this, this cognitive science hypothesis uh, is telling us that the way that we formulate language, um, we're looking for an even distribution of information across, our, across the linguistic signal. Um, we're not like trying to optimally pack all of our information into the fewest number of words possible because that makes for strange speech. Um, and further, we want to make sure that there isn't this huge difference in the amount of information between words that we're giving. Um, so let's look at a concrete example of the uniform information uh, uh, density hypothesis to give it some motivation. So here we have the sentence, uh, how big is the family that you cook for? Um, now, what's important to realize is that this sentence is also grammatically correct without the word that. But it just sounds better with it, right? Um, there's something slightly more awkward about saying, how big is the family you cook for? It just sounds a little better with the word that in there. And the information theoretic explanation for this is that without that, the word you conveys two pieces of information at the same time, the onset of the relative clause and part of its internal contents. So including this relativizer spreads uh, the information across two words more evenly, um, thereby distributing information across the sentence and avoiding an instance of high surprisal. Okay, so this is a nice hypothesis, right? It's a nice idea. Um, but where's the proof? How do, we, how do we actually know that this is uh, what's going on when we are evaluating language for its quality? So to answer that question, um, we ran some machine translation uh, experiments using our regularized objective from earlier for various uh, values of lambda. So here the y-axis is lambda. So that's the strength of our beam search regularizer penalty. And um, the y-axis, there's two y-axis here, uh, is standard deviation of surprisal in blue. So here we can see that blue and uh, surprisal are really just like mirroring each other um, in the negative sense. So higher surprisal, lower blue. Um, it's pretty like astounding just the uh, level of matching that's going on here. Um, and so, you can also see that there's quite a high R squared between the values. Um, so this kind of does give us the sense that yes, um, UID is a is a prominent quality of high of of high quality language. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, the next question is: Does Beam Search enforce UID? Like, are we absolutely sure of this? Are we just thinking this? Are we just speculating? Um, so 
uh, here we can see an example of that. Um, you can recall that our standard decoding objective um, explicitly minimizes the sum of surprisals. So it's maximizing log probability here. Um, and the solution returned by exact search here is actually, uh, so this is a global optimum, um, the highest probability sequence under the model. And the reason it's a dot is because it's the empty string. It's basically our model just at the get-go chooses uh, the empty string. And uh, that's like, because of the way that this, the way that our scoring function works, um, as you append words, the score can only go down, right? This is log probability. So you add on another token, the log probability decreases. Um, and that's kind of why this happens. Um, but anyway, so we see if we, so we see that when we add in some regularization, um, that's the red and orange curves. So uh, when we add in some of this like surprisal regularization, we see that we can, um, we can sort of discourage moments of high surprisal, right? Um, but we see that they eventually sort of end up taking like when our penalty isn't big enough that we, we end up uh, still taking moments of high surprisal in order to avoid accumulating costs down the line. Um, and here we see that the solution returned by beam search though, is actually doing a really nice job of keeping surprisal evenly distributed. Um, and that actually the purple curve is not just the, um, the solution of beam search, it's also the same solution returned by um, exact search with um, a regularizer penalty of one. Um, so we see that this, this regularizer is actually um, forcing the same thing as beam search to happen. Okay, um, yeah, so as I was saying, the beam search is doing a nice job of making sure that surprisal is evenly distributed. Um, okay, so in the final part of this paper, um, we want to look into whether we could explicitly- Sarah, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it in the first mi few minutes because I, uh, I missed it, but um, in the implementations of beam, beam search that I'm familiar with, um, it doesn't actually, look at the sum of log probabilities, it looks at the mean log probabilities and that's how it compares strings of different uh, lengths. So that's, um, I mean, beam, what you have to keep in mind is that the beam search algorithm is different than like the objective function, right? You can use any objective function with beam search. Beam search is just a search algorithm. Um, and the objective that you're talking about is uh, length normalization. Um, so, that's one yeah. way to sort of like mitigate the problems with uh, choosing, like it, it would mitigate the problems we see here, right? So then- No, so I'm, it's actually, I'm asking, doesn't it, in, doesn't the fact that we're looking at, um, I mean, that the implementation of beam search is basically looking for a string that um, has like an, uh, the, the best average probability per token, and not necessarily like the best probability of the string, uh, doesn't that create this kind of, uh, uh, you know, flat curve, low surprisal curve? So again, like this is- I'm, I'm asking, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a little bit conflating like the beam search algorithm with the objective. Mm -hmm. So the objective that you're talking about is like length normalized decoding, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is not really, that's, it's a kind of a hack, right? Because what we're doing is we're model, modeling a probability distribution over strings. Exactly. Um, it's no longer so once you divide by the length, then you kind of lose that interpretation. Exactly. Um, you're no longer in a, in a proper uh, search space. Yeah, because yeah. you're you're not you don't have like monotonic uh, actions anymore. And... Right. Yeah. But and but on the other hand, that's what happens in practice. Yes, that's what we end up doing in practice, and that's because if we don't, then we end up with like things that, like we, we do that. We we normalize by length because people have seen that it returns better results because it sort of does enforce this more like like okay, you know, you can't take a high surprisal choice. Um, or like a, you can't take a low probability choice just to finish early, right? Exactly. Um, and actually we do compare to length normalization. Um, length normalization actually does, so um, like the sort of beam search curse is 
that as you uh, as you increase the beam width, then your blue score starts to go down. And this exactly. is with like I'm talking about like normal normal objective of just log probability, not length normalized. Um, and actually, you know what? I'm just gonna go to this this slide really quickly. Okay, here. Um, so here we can see that log probability of, um, uh, sorry, so the orange curve is unregularized. Um, it's just the normal yeah. log probability objective. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have length normalized on here, but length normalized actually also decreases um, as the, the beam width in, as the beam width gets bigger. So we also yeah. do see this sort of phenomenon where um, our blue, the blue score of our generated text goes down um, as we increase the beam width, even with low, um, length normalization. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's right. Yeah, um, but it, we, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to bring up length normalization because it is almost like another regularizer. Um, we didn't really, like we kind of tried to link the, it to our other firms, like our other regularizers that were proposed, um, but it's a little bit wonky. <laughs> Um, exactly. It's because uh, because you're no longer in the proper search space. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Um, yeah. Anyway, th thanks for answering. Uh, yeah. Of course. I don't. I don't want to <laughs> uh, uh, take you on a tangent too much. No. No. I mean, it, I, it's it's an important part of this problem, <laughs> right? There's. It, it's an important thing to bring up because I mean, I probably should should be bringing it up because the way that most people know of decoding language generators is actually um, through this like length normalized version. Uh, yeah. And it's just sort of like what's taken is like, oh yeah, you know, everyone does it, so we do it. But then when you sit there and think about it, you're like, oh, like we have a probabilistic model here. Um, we're doing that and we're losing this like probabilistic interpretation. And it's like, literally we're just doing it because it's a hack. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that, that that most bothered me when I was teaching uh, beam search in my in my course. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's um, no, it is just it it is just important to like always remember that like the algorithm is the the objective is not like encoded into the yeah. algorithm. Yeah. Um, right. So um, on that note, <laughs> we. Uh, so we have our regularized decoding objective here. Um, and we're asking now if we can encourage explicitly uniform information density in our generated text. Um, so just keep in mind that here we're, we're not doing set optimization because that's actually like, when you think about it, it's like if we're dealing with an exponential number of strings then we're dealing with like a really big number of sets out there. So in practice, we just do decoding on like the uh, sequence level. So we're going to, uh, we started with our greedy regularizer and this is the one that mimics beam search uh, with a beam size of one. Um, so, but we also ask if we can discourage high variance in surprisals. Um, and this is actually one of the ones, like this is one that's probably most similar to length normalization. Um, so it's sort of like saying that the average, um, like each step has to be close to the average. Um, but this is, this is pretty much the closest we came to length normalization as an objective. Um, and so we have, um, like we could also discourage uh, variance locally. So saying that the discrepancy between time steps needs to be low. Um, we can discourage instances of high surprisal um, and we can discourage consistently high surprisal. So this is just like taking, like adding on a uh, squared term for each of the surprisals, which means that like, if you take a high surprisal choice, you'll really get penalized. Um, so uh, we see that in action using these regularizers actually does seem to uh, help blue score um, as, the beam through, as the beam width is increased. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the orange line here is unregularized decoding. Um, I did not put length normalization on here just because it made the graph even harder to read uh, with all of the different regularizers, but um, length, uh, length normalization does also slightly decrease with uh, an increase in beam width. Um, but here we see like for the greedy regularizer that basically we're able to, uh, as the beam width increases, keep the same blue score.
so what this sort of gets at is that our um, objective with this regularization is a better language generation objective. Um, yeah. So also just here's the like actual numbers in case anyone wants to see them at any point. So here we can see like, yes, length normalization as we go to a beam with a 500, um, it also decreases, um, yeah. And when we regularize, it, we seem to be able to mitigate that. Um, and also it seems like one regularizer is good enough, which is important because you don't wanna be tuning over 10 different regularizers to find the optimal collection. Um, so to conclude, um, in this work, we framed beam search uh, as a solution to an exact decoding problem. And we provided evidence that beam search has an inductive bias, which can be linked to the promotion of uniform information density. Um, and this is a theory from cognitive science that talks about how humans generate good speech. Um, and we observe that a, there's a strong relationship between variants of surprisals, which is what we use as our oper operationalization of uniform information density, and blue score, which is our quality metric for uh, neural machine translation models. Um, so then based off of this, we designed a set of objectives to explicitly encourage uniform information density in text. Um, and we see that that actually alleviates the quality degradation that we typically see with increased beam widths. So thank you for watching and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I think I, I stumbled through a little bit of that. I'm still sort of a little bit sleep deprived here, but I'm happy to clarify anything. So please ask away. <laughs>